Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, good morning. It is my honor and my pleasure to welcome you to this panel discussion on digital security at the Internet Governments Forum 2019 in Berlin. My name is Daniel Brinkwert. I'm a managing partner at the advisory firm Joint Plus, and I will guide you through this session. Today's um, panel is brought to you by the Charter of Trust. Uh, this is, in essence, the Munich Security Conference plus 15 global industry leaders. And together, these organizations uh, have set out to improve cybersecurity in the business sphere. In the uh, next 90 minutes or so, uh, we will explore the digital security landscape that private bus businesses are facing today. And we will try to map out what companies, big and small, can do in order to mitigate uh, cyber risks for their organization. The title of the session is Cybersecurity Concerns Everyone responsibility and education throughout the digital supply chain. Uh, when discussing this, we want to focus on two questions today. Uh, the first one is how we can manage digital security risks in the global supply chain. And that in turn is ultimately also the question of how we can establish trust between business partners. And related to that is the second focal point for today's session, which is the role of education in digital security. And here we want to cover both um, the role of cybersecurity experts, but also the cyber hygiene and awareness of the regular employee and citizen. Obviously, uh, business cannot operate in a political vacuum, and this is why I'm glad to welcome our first speaker to the stage, uh, who will set the scene um, for us today. Uh, Laurent Bernard, he's a digital security leader at the OECD in Paris, and together with his team, he's currently working on the OECD's latest iteration of uh, digital security recommendations and uh, policy toolkits for governments. And of course, as you all know, um, the OECD does not only support its own governments, but is also a sought after knowledge partner for G20 and other international important global fora. Without much further ado, Laurent, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I'm going to give some introductory remarks, pretty high level, but kind of setting the scene from an OECD perspective. But first of all, I'd like to, to thank the members of the Charter of Trust and, and you, Daniel, for inviting me to participate in this IGF workshop and to say a few words on behalf of the OECD. Uh, so in, in case you don't know the OECD, uh, there are two key points that describe our organization. First, uh, the OECD is an intergovernmental organization that works to build better policies for better life. Together with governments, policymakers, and citizens, we work on establishing international norms and finding solutions to social and economic challenges. We provide a unique forum for analysis, exchange of best practice, and advice on public policies and global standard setting. Second, the OECD has been working on digital security since the early 1990s. And since these prehistorical days, uh, these policy discussions have taken place in a multi-stakeholder fashion. Today, the OECD works on these issues through its newly established Working Party on Security in the Digital Economy and its Global Forum on Digital Security for Prosperity, which both gather representatives of governments as well as businesses, civil society, and the internet technical community. A key pillar of OECD work on digital security is the 2015 Council Recommendation on Digital Security Risk Management for Economic and Social Prosperity. This is an international legal instrument, soft law instrument, um, which uh, provides principles on how to approach security without inhibiting the potential of ICTs to foster innovation and growth. The OECD encourages governments and other stakeholders to approach digi digital security as an economic and social risk management challenge, other than only as a technical, national security, or international security issue. This is why we prefer the term digital over cyber security. Digital is consistent with digital technology, digital economy, and digital transformation. I'm not exactly sure what cyber means, actually, but it's clearly connoted with national and international security and with uh, criminal law enforcement, cyber warfare, cyber defense, cyber espionage, cyber crime. Digital security helps emphasizing that the benefits and risks from using digital technologies are two facets of the same coin and should be managed in tandem rather than in silo or in tension. So the title of this workshop is Cybersecurity Concerns Everyone. I could not agree more. Uh, 
And I would go two steps further than that. As a first step, I would quote the responsibility principle of the 2015 recommendation that I just mentioned. The principle states that all stakeholders should take responsibility for the management of digital security risks based on their role, the context, and their ability to act. Now, this is a strong statement. Being responsible is more than feeling concerned. It implies action. It implies accepting the consequences of one's action or lack of action. It implies accountability and perhaps, depending on the context, liability. And since there are many categories of stakeholders with different roles who are all interdependent and should all take some responsibility, the only way they can make some progress is by cooperating with each other. So this is the second step beyond cybersecurity concerns everyone. All stakeholders should cooperate, including across borders. That's another principle of the 2015 recommendation. Cooperation and partnerships are essential to manage and reduce digital security risk for oneself and for all. This takes me to the Charter of Trust, which we view as a very important initiative. We understand the Charter of Trust as a sign of increased maturity on the part of business with respect to digital security. Stefan uh, will explain what is the Charter of Trust uh, right after me, so I won't speak about it in detail. But I would like to note that this is a partnership <coughs> between 16 large firms which have agreed to take responsibility, precisely, and to cooperate, to agree on key principles, to share good practices, to promote them, and to build trust. This is very important, in particular considering their profile and the mix of roles they represent. We have in the Charter of Trust, uh, firms from industry, from the ICT sector, test inspection and certification companies, and insurance. And maybe I forget, forget some. Uh, so it's, it's really an interesting mix. What is particularly interesting with this group is that they are not getting together to point fingers at other categories of stakeholders like governments or customers or whatever, others, to say you should take responsibility. Rather, they work together to promote the good practice and for themselves and for others. There are also large firms from different countries and regions with activities spanning beyond national borders. So this echoes very nicely the responsibility and cooperation principle of the OECD digital security recommendation. As I said, this initiative is a sign of increased maturity on the part of business with respect to digital security, and the presence of our panelists today at the IGF is an illustration of that. I remember trying to set up a group, uh, to set, sorry, to set up a, an IGF workshop with several business speakers beyond the traditional ICT sector a few years ago, and I could only bring one, uh, and he was speaking remotely, actually. Uh, for, well, so you see, times are changing, and that's a very good sign. Uh, I would like also to highlight that governments are also evolving, and public policy is getting more mature. This is reflected in the work that our member countries most recently agreed to carry out at the OECD. Over the last 20 years, we have been primarily developing principles on how users, mainly organizations, should protect themselves. And now the focus of our work is expanding to address new areas. 10 days ago, for example, the OECD Global Forum on Digital Security for Prosperity held its second annual event in London engaging in an in-depth multi-stakeholder dialogue on digital security innovation. The event gathered 150 participants, including entrepreneurs, venture capital, large corporations, civil society academia, and governments. Uh, they met at Plexal, which is a digital accelerator based in London, which is the home of the London Office for Rapid Cybersecurity Advancement, LORCA a UK public-private cybersecurity innovation hub. So we actually had a meeting on innovation in a, very, in a place where there is innovation is happening, actually, including cybersecurity innovation. But our current core analytical work focuses on how to improve the digital security of products while taking into account the complexity of value chain and uh, the different stages of product life, cy life cycle. In this work, products are understood as goods and services provided in commercial and non-commercial contexts. So a software package, a cloud service, an IoT device, but also a government website. 
This work takes us to a new area where we are trying to better understand why the market does not generate products with a sufficient level of security. What are the incentives for vendors to make more secure products? Why products do not always integrate patching mechanisms? Why vendors do not always provide security updates? I'm thinking in particular in the IoT world. What are the obstacles they face, such as the complexity of their value chain, for example? So this work also requires to understand the information asymmetries that prevent the market from leading to the adoption of good security practice. We are also exploring the potential for labeling, certification, new ideas such as bills of material, or software bills of material, and other approaches to improve this situation. While focusing on products, we are also working on how to encourage responsible management and disclosure of vulnerabilities and on how to clarify the scope of businesses' action in the course of attacks, a project, the last one, that we call Responsible Response. All this work could potentially lead to the development of high-level policy principles and set new avenues for enhancing digital security without inhibiting economic and social prosperity, which is really the, 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 the objective, the overall objective that we have at the OECD. I understand that the panel will discuss the second principle of the Charter of Trust on responsibility throughout the supply chain. So there are very interesting synergies between what the Charter of Trust is doing and our work at the OECD. I take this opportunity to highlight that the OECD Working Party on Security in the Digital Economy, which held its first meeting last week, agreed to set up a multi-stakeholder informal expert group expert advisory group, actually, to provide input in order to ensure that our analysis is as well informed and balanced as possible. Experts will come from business, civil society, academia, the technical community. Experts from the members of the Charter of Trust actually are welcome to join, and some have already provided comments on preliminary draft reports. So to conclude, I would like to confirm, yes, cybersecurity concerns everyone. But those who take responsibility according to their role and cooperate to share good practice and improve risk management and improve their risk management are clearly showing the way forward. So thank you again for inviting me, and I'm more than happy to participate in the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Laurent, for this uh, introduction to our topic today. And this certainly, you certainly touched upon a lot of points that we will get back to during that panel discussion. Uh, before we do that, however, um, I would like to ask our second speaker onto the stage, who will share with us a brief history of the origins and objectives of the Charter of Trust Cyber Initiative. Stefan, please join us here. Normally, as per our program, I would be uh, welcoming Eva Schultz come here today. Unfortunately, she cannot be with us, um, but I'm uh, ever more so glad to have Stefan here, Stefan Saatmann, who's the Global Coordinator Cybersecurity Policy at Siemens AG. Stefan, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Lauren, for your introduction. Um, a warm welcome to the United Nations Internet Governance Forum 2019 here in Berlin from my side. Uh, it's another good example for acting local but being global at the same time we are here on the Internet via live stream. So um, my name is Stefan Saatmann. I work as a global policy coordinator for Siemens, and I'm part of the Chart of Trust core team. And I would like to present to you um, the Chart of Trust, what it's all about, and where we currently are, and giving examples of the first results of the digital supply chain and the cybersecurity baseline requirements that we develop for that. So I would like to start with a clear statement. Security is the prerequisite for so many things in our public and private life. And it has become more complex uh, as technology is increasing, as processes are changing. And that is why the cybersecurity topic, and I call it cybersecurity, we can later discuss on the um, uh, methodology behind it, um, is, is becoming more urgent. So what is behind that? Um, that is not just for one reason, several global trends are driving this. Uh, let me pick one example, uh, growing cyber risk to business uh, and the Allianz, which is also a partner of Chart of Trust, global report on business risk, cybersecurity is under the top three business risks. Um, and uh, another example is the um, um, workforce gap is widening, so worldwide there are three million cybersecurity experts missing, uh, so that 
uh, brings us uh, in particular to the point that this topic is really an urgent one and we should um, act together. We have a strong need to act together. So um, that is why um, Siemens and the Munich Security Conference uh, with strong partners from uh, diverse backgrounds have initiated together the Charter of Trust on the 14th of February 2018. And the goal behind that, um, actually there are three goals behind that. So first, um, to protect the data of individuals and companies. Second, to prevent harm from companies' infrastructure um, digital infrastructure and physical infrastructure. And third one is um, also to develop a solid base on how to go further with this important topic. And I will uh, shortly come to the first results out of that. The basis for that and the frame for that is the 10 principles of the Chart of Trust. You can see them here. They start from an organizational point of view, so ownership of cyber and IT security must be reflected in company organizations. Responsibility throughout the digital supply chain, which is really one of the greatest challenges in that environment. Dealing, for example, for Siemens only with 90,000 suppliers uh, is not an easy thing. Uh, security by default, which is the technology level of that development um, uh, in the area of solution services and products, uh, this has really become also another key differentiator. User centricity simply means you need to think uh, newly uh, from the end. We have innovation and co-creation, which is reflected also by the partnering approach in the Chart of Trust. We have education uh, coming to the trend of the workforce gap. Uh, we have certification, which was already mentioned by Laurent as a big topic, where we need to find a line where we have to be certified, where probably self-assessments are already sufficient. Transparency and response, uh, regulatory framework and joint initiative approach is summing it up. So, so this is the frame. From that, the charter started to develop in working groups uh, first results, and um, we have developed a new approach. So we look at technology, uh, meaning that we really analyze and try to find pilots uh, for global uh, baseline requirements and best practices. We also shape the political debate, engaging uh, and offering ideas from these uh, private industry uh, cybersecurity initiative, which is also one of the uh, key differentiators. And the third one is, of course, um, we see there's also um, some potential for um, uh, making cybersecurity part of the digital business models. In the end, it's all about the trust. Trust needs to be, um, it's not something you're, you just earn, it. you have to work on it, uh, and, and this, is, this is what we will also continue. And after two years, we can proudly say, yes, we did it, we have achieved first results and um, on, on several areas. So together, we scale supply chain security, we shape uh, the regulation and standardization as we offer our ideas of um, supply chain baseline requirements. We work on security by default and have uh, developed the first uh, phases concept. We turn cybersecurity into a real business opportunity, meaning that is all becoming part of our daily business and we drive the education. And let me give you uh, one uh, deep dive in the uh, supply chain area. So within, these, within our um, uh, trust network, uh, we have uh, we came up with this um, uh, approach. So we have agreed upon 17 baseline requirements as the foundation of the secure digital supply chain. We have um, find a methodology for supplier cr criticality. Simply means, of course, um, this has to be manageable. And uh, as it has to be manageable, we need to really distinguish what our um, high risk uh, processes. What uh, is something that we can uh, give another priority. And third one, the verification methods. So uh, here you can see that uh, from self-declaration, self-assessment to documented proof, we also distinguish between those um, uh, uh, verifications. And um, this is probably something which is really bad to read. Um, however, I, I wanted to show you that uh, we are not doing this uh, from, from outer space. We are looking upon global standards. So here on the right side of the chart, you can see the ISE uh, 62443, which is, prob uh, for example, for the industry environment, a very important standard. Uh, a mapping uh, also to the, to the METI uh, CPSF, which is from Japan, uh, just, just reflecting that we really have a global approach here. And these um, um, baseline requirements 
They serve on, on eight different categories, um, uh, data protection, security policies, incident response, site security, which, which is the physical layer of the cybersecurity as we understand it, uh, access intervention, transfer separation, integrity and av availability, support and training. And let me just simply pick one of them, which is, for example, access intervention, transfer and separation. We say, okay, encryption and key management shall be available when appropriate to protect data. When appropriate, of course, means that there has to be a risk analysis uh, before that and before deciding uh, which, which kind of um, uh, technology I put to which kind of process. So that's, in a, in a, in a nutshell, um, what we achieved. And um, uh, here you also find some more examples, which I will, due to the time, uh, uh, not, not, not deepen here. Um, and uh, let, me, let me sum it up. This is not the end of this. Um, uh, we want to take it to the next level together, and um, I'm looking forward to the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan. We will now be proceeding to our um, panel discussion, and Stefan, please indeed choose a seat. I will now uh, like to call on the other panelists to the stage. Um, we have here with us Dr. Alexander Wolf, CEO of Business Assurance at TÜV Süter Welcome, Alex. We have uh, Jacques Kruse-Brandao, Global Head of Advocacy at SGS. Morning, Jack. And Jochen Friedrich, Technical Relations Executive at IBM. Good morning, gentlemen. Jochen, let us jump straight in. How has the digital security landscape changed over the last decade, and how did that influence the decision of IBM to co-found the Charter of Trust? How does that sit together? Oh, that's a, that's a broad question. How, much, how many hours do I have? Um, I, I think Laurent already made a lot of interesting statements here, how, how the, the landscape has changed, and it's probably due to a lot of different factors. We are in... I'm not sure whether we are at the beginning or whether digitalization has already heavily started. It probably has already heavily started, but we are at the beginning. So digital technologies are pervasive. They are everywhere. You look at individual users. We are more and more using digital devices. We experience the need to have secure devices, uh, secure communication individually. Probably everybody already has had viruses uh, and, and luckily had installed virus protection systems on their PC. Um, you experience it everywhere. You want to have end-to-end -end encryption if you use messaging tools, etc. So there is a, a key increase in individual um, awareness of this. And uh, you, you want to have the technologies that are easy to handle and to protect you. But at the same time, industry. Uh, we, are, we are talking about digitalization of industry, industry 4.0 in Germany, industrial internet, uh, uh, as the term is worldwide, or digitization of European industry. Um, here you see that also more and more processes, more and more um, uh, machinery is driven by IT. Almost every process, every piece of equipment now has an intelligence layer um, with it. And with this, um, it's, it's uh, important that this runs without impact, that this runs secure, uh, that safety is not impacted by this. Um, so there is a really pervasive need for secure technologies. Um, and uh, everybody is aware of it, and we are all aware of it. Our customers for IBM are aware of it. Um, so when being asked to, to join uh, and co-found the Chart of Trust, I would say we didn't have to think twice. Uh, we thought it was a, a, uh, an excellent idea. It was also very good to work together, not just with IT companies, but uh, with companies coming from different sectors. So those who are traditionally also our customers, who experience the problem where we support uh, them with IT technologies and on this basis we thought this is this is instrumental to work together to cooperate and it was already stressed uh, and see how we can drive IT security uh, across the the full portfolio of, of technologies that are running and the full pro uh, portfolio of processes. Thank you Jochen. Laurent a question to you now that we have learned a little bit more about um, the principles of the Charter of Trust when uh, looking at the materials, the draft recommendations that the OECD is currently working on, I have the feeling that there's a lot of overlap there. Have these guys been copying from you, or is there an emerging consensus on what needs to be done? Well, of course they have copied. No, I don't know. But um, well, I, I think uh, 
we operate at different levels and it's very complementary. So we, 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 we operate at the high level, high policy level, I would say, high level of policy, something like that. And um, these people are operating, like they're in the field, they are doing it. And so they face the complexity of this in a very com concrete way. I think what is, what is happening is that uh, we are probably at, a, at an interesting moment where we sense that there is some more action from the government is coming. For many years it was, it was basically just uh, let it happen, it's good for, uh, for the economy that we have all these digital things going everywhere. But now we see the security issues as becoming important, and so governments are saying, well, perhaps we should have a closer look at that and start to think about regulation. And at the same time, the private sector is, is, is looking at it and saying, well, we should anticipate that potential regulation and inform the policy-making process. And we are at the OECD somewhere in the middle, uh, trying to learn from the field, which is why we need this uh, input from the stakeholders, and informing the, the policymakers, but also reflecting back what happens at the policy level. So I'm not sure I responded to your question, but that's my... <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think you did, thank you. Um, Alex, um, one of our focal points today is supply chain security. Can yeah. you explain to yeah. us what the problem is there and what the approach of the Charter is to solve that? Well, I think the, the problem is twofold. One thing is uh, you want to make sure that your product is safe and secure. That's one thing. You don't want to have anything bad happen. And the other perspective of this is you don't want to have an interruption in your own production because this can also cost you a lot of money. And I think Stefan has done an excellent job in, in uh, and thankfully showing the two pictures because it's very complex. There are these 17 baseline requirements, just complex to remember in the end, it's pretty simple. Yeah? Um, 17 baseline requirements have been established which are going to put you already on a level which is better than what, what many people have already now. And then the second step is to run this um, risk-based approach or common risk-based approach where you have this category of three levels and you go for the higher criticality. And this is actually pretty common. And the good thing about this whole cybersecurity thing is actually we have seen this in the past uh, when you had these transitions in technology. Um, it's just a bit more complex and fully global right now. Thank you. Um, Stefan, you already mentioned the amount of uh, supplies that you're dealing with uh, at Siemens. How fast do you intend to roll out the baseline requirements to your supply base? Um, we are already doing it uh, in, two, in two ways. So first we have um, added TNCs with the cybersecurity clause uh, in, in that. And second, uh, the new suppliers um, who needs to qualify to uh, work together with us and uh, who we want to work together with have to adopt to these 17 baseline requirements. Uh, but this is uh, an ongoing process and um, I would say that um, we look at our suppliers as partners. So uh, it's not that we leave them alone uh, with these baseline requirements. We also try to um, develop together this um, uh, realization because it brings us to the, to the higher level of security. Thank you. Um, Jacques, what approach does the charter take to assess supplies in the end? We just heard from Siemens that they've been treated as a partner, but nonetheless there needs to be some sort of an assessment and some, some, some sort of finding out whether they're actually uh, living up to the specifications of the baseline requirements. How, how do we do that? So basically, um, as the tick industry and, and, and we as SGS and also TÜV Süd, we are the ones who are um, generating trust usually between two parties to, who, to, who do business together, right? So one is asking certain requirements, certain KPIs, and the other one, um, yeah, should believe it. And, and this is always difficult if you're not in the same city, if you're not in the same country, if you're living in different uh, political situations and different legal systems. So usually you ask a third party, and this is the tech industry. And we are uh, generating trust by, um, by assessing um, what has been said is implemented. And we do this uh, for, for many things, for nearly everything uh, uh, which, is, uh, which can be tested in the world. Think about food, think about electronic devices, think about minerals, all uh, ingredients of food, etc. cetera. Um, and also cybersecurity. So if one is um, mentioning he implemented certain security features into his devices and services, and of course you should ask a third party to verify this. 
did I do this in the right way? Usually you ask hackers, right? Um, please check my device whether I implemented my security uh, features uh, properly. Um, but if you have done this, of course you want to show this to your customers. Um, the purchasing process is a, is a very important, um, let's say, um, task here. Um, recently I talked to a purchasing um, um, colleague of a, of a big company and uh, I asked, how do you um, ask your suppliers today? And she said she has a set of questions and it was, I think, unbelievable, unbelievable 800 questions. And I asked her, how do you... How long do, you, do the suppliers need to answer those questions? And she said, usually eight weeks. Oh, okay, and how long does your purchasing process, uh, or how long are your tenders for purchasing? And she said, four weeks. So this does not fit, right? So we need rules, we need standards, we need harmonized standards, and as, as we are living in a global economy, um, we are here to discuss how we can achieve harmonized standards on a global level. Um, of course, we see the, the European Cybersecurity Act now in Europe popping up, uh, or in place, sorry, in place, and uh, we need to fill the framework and we need to define um, what exactly are the requirements which need to be fulfilled, um, that companies have the chance to fulfill those requirements and then to, uh, uh, that those features will be assessed and then can be can be proven um, by, by the tech companies. And, and this is why we are here in the Charter of Trust active, because Charter of Trust, trust is the main, the main issue here, and uh, trust always needs, or not always, but very often needs a third party um, who, um, which yeah, uh, certify or at least uh, test and, and evaluate that uh, the implementation has been done properly. Thank you. Um, Jochen, just so that we get this right, so are these uh, baseline requirements mandatory now, or what happens if a supplier cannot meet them? They, they should be, it should be in the interest of every supplier to uh, fulfill these baseline requirements. And what I think is very, very good in this approach and very worth mentioning is um, the mapping to uh, standards to available standards. We are, we are not trying to define now a charter of trust technology that you follow and are locked in. We are trying to refine, define requirements and everybody can be sure that you meet these requirements if you implement the respective and follow the respective standards, international standards uh, preferably. And um, IBM has always been very active and, and our colleagues here as well in international standardization for IT in, at ISO level uh, 27,001 was listed there. There are others in the 27,000 series that are uh, uh, helpful, important. Um, we do have in Europe a, an infrastructure in the standardization organizations that can adopt these international standards as European standards. They could be um, uh, adjusted to European needs if necessary, but most of the times they, they are global, they are available. So by, by identifying these requirements, they should be not made mandatory, but it should be in everybody's, uh, almost get into everybody's genes and DNA to say we want to fulfill these requirements. And you get practical advice by looking at the international standards, how you can meet them. And this is the, uh, the, the great advantage, I believe, and the great step we are trying to promote here uh, with the Charter of Trust. So, like and, and what we did here in the Charter of Trust, we, we mapped the existing uh, cybersecurity um, international standards to the requirements we defined as a Charter of Trust, as the Charter of Trust members. And um, this was uh, a first task, let's say, and uh, this is um, pretty easy then to, let's say, fulfill those requirements once you know what, you, what, is, what is expected to implement. And maybe this is uh, one of the big advantages what, what we are doing here. Um, Stefan, uh, which measures are you taking otherwise to help your suppliers uh, meet that benchmark? And are you envisioning any other positive incentives for them, like developing a trust mark, something like this, something they can put on their website and, and demonstrate that they're up to, up to the level? Well, I think the um, uh, recognition uh, in the supply chain that cybersecurity and that baseline requirements are important and that uh, for the supplier's own business, uh, it's important to secure the processes and technologies and to train their people, I think uh, is, is, is really a trend. And I think today you don't have to persuade somebody that this is an important task. 
However, when it comes to business and to contracts, you have to negotiate. And uh, that's why the baseline requirements really set the floor and set the ground for the digital security. So you can always do more. Uh, you can do more, of course, uh, when you come to the um, uh, result in your risk uh, analysis that uh, this is pro probably something you have to uh, look on. Uh, what, what we do as Siemens, of course, is that, uh, first of all, we, we care for our people, for our supply chain management. That means that uh, we also see a trend that cybersecurity and supply chain management kind of merge together. Um, uh, and then, of course, when it comes to our suppliers, uh, yeah, we do we do uh, say, okay, these are the baseline requirements, you have to fulfill them. But um, if they are not able to, we of course offer also um, sort of um, uh, consulting and also um, the um, uh, together develop uh, uh, mechanisms and tools that they can qualify for that. So um, in the end, uh, we have to do it together. We have to do it uh, uh, in, a, in a joint approach. Um, but we have to also find the line where we say, okay, these baseline requirements we have to fulfill. Alex, please. Yeah, uh, bringing in on this, uh, I see a high similarity to previous, let's say, like management systems we have experienced in the past. Yeah, uh, I recall the introduction of the ISO 9000 quality management system in automotive. Yeah, before you had supplier development. Yeah, and this is actually what is going to happen. What is at least my prediction also now. You need to educate your suppliers to get better, and this will, is going to take some time, but then um, you will reap the benefits from that. And, and, and is absolutely right, and, and now it's even beyond that, um, because we need to look into the devices, we need to look into the backend systems, we need to look into the communication channels. We have a huge discussion about, about trust in 5G equipment, right? So we need to discuss that, what level of, of security is expected from, for, for which use cases. So we need to discuss those use cases to come to a proper assessment uh, when we talk about risks. And, and also risk is related to impact. High risk can have a low impact or high impact can, uh, have a low, uh, can be related to a small risk. So um, it's not about the risk only, but we need, and we need to have different views. We have the business views, of course, we have the, but we have also the, the society view and the, and the, uh, the citizen view from a, from, a, from a society perspective. So um, taking all these, these uh, uh, risks into account, I think we have a pretty good view what is expected and uh, can implement that accordingly. You mentioned the, uh, the question of uh, trust in IoT devices uh, and how to deal with that. Uh, Jochen, what is your approach to that? Uh, how, how should we deal with uh, the tons of non-compliant IoT devices sitting out there in businesses and, and, and homes which are already out there today? <laughs> oh, tough question. First of all, I believe um, we, we have in the chart of trust also the principle of security by design. And this is very important here, uh, that uh, already when you develop certain devices, security is a, a key feature, a key requirement that you are looking at, that every manufacturer is looking at, and, and uh, this will help drive forward um, security. Now, you, you asked how should we deal with non-compliant IoT devices. Um, non-compliant to the requirements in the Charter of Trust uh, in, in B2B, um, there should be a, a tough check, yes. Um, you should really, every, you should check with your suppliers and, and with the providers of IoT devices, do they meet these requirements? And if not, there should be a clear market pressure um, not to use them. Uh, and this requires a high level of education, a high level of transparency, how, how have they been develop and uh, exactly tick the boxes, have the requirements been, uh, been fulfilled, I believe. Right. Stefan, you would like to add to that? Yes, uh, I would specify it's security by default. Uh, I, oh, think, I, think, I, think, I think we as Siemens, uh, um, we, we really want to have security by design, but this is a, from a process perspective. It's also something we are working on, but it's, it's, it's currently under development. So I think security by default is really the highest security standards uh, within the products, within the solutions when you deliver them. Uh, this is also a paradigm shift in the uh, product solution uh, design and uh, um, delivery. So um, uh, I think it's uh, important at that point that we, of course, also transparently speak about what we do and all the suppliers, all the environment, the whole ecosystem 
journalists, uh, society can, can look uh, what, what we are doing, what we are developing, and we are uh, actively speaking about it in the chart of trust. And I think this is also so somehow a new approach uh, which we uh, found here, uh, um, offering our view uh, what we think is important for for achieving a higher level of cybersecurity. Of course, in the end, uh, um, the, the governments are, are in responsible to set the frame of the market, uh, but we can uh, say, okay, these are industry best practices. This is, this is also manageable uh, for us, and this is also something where we look, of course, at, at costs, at, at, at business perspectives, because we have to make, make that work. And uh, I think this is something where also this forum here now um, is, is a good point to engage with. Laurent, you wanted to weigh in. Yeah, yes, yeah, so on, on IoT uh, product security, we, we are, as I, as I said, we are working on um, how to enhance uh, digital security of products, and we've started to look at this IoT problem. Um, and uh, one other thing that came up already is the information asymmetry problem, the fact that when you, when you buy something, you actually don't know what the level of security of the product is, and you have no way to compare uh, products on the basis of security. And that, that's not driving the market in the right direction. Uh, it's not creating incentives for uh, producers to, to put more security in the devices. But another interesting uh, thing that came up in the work is that we started to talk with our colleagues who deal with product safety. And I'm talking here physical product safety. Basically, you know, you buy a shelf in a store and you, 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 you build it at home. There is a famous brand uh, selling this stuff. And uh, there is a regulation to ensure that the shelf doesn't fall on your kids when they try to get a book or something. Well, okay, it's product safety regulation. And uh, when the product has a defect, uh, there is a, a mechanism in the regulation so that the vendor uh, recalls the product and it's fixed, etc. So while well, this whole community uh, of um, regulators is now thinking, well, many of the products we regulate under the pro product safety regulation have now digital components, perhaps not the shelves, but others, like cars, for example, or home appliances. They have digital components, and di these digital components can create security issues, information security issues, or digital security issues, which can have safety consequences on consumers. So are we, we the product safety regulators, competent? Uh, can we apply our framework to this? And so they are discovering this digital world, not really at the beginning of the process, not really understanding that other people in the government are also looking at the di digital security, cyber security aspects, scratching their heads saying, well, should we regulate or not? And what should we do? How should we encourage the market, etc." cetera? And, and currently we see the very early stages of these two regulators talking to each other, well, maybe the second one is not really a regulator, but the, these two parts of the government talking to each other to try to improve the, the, the situation. So it's really like this is, it's not just like the, the private sector should cooperate. Uh, we have this private, private cooperation taking place, which is very important. It's also within the governments, try to break the silos to, make, to, to, to improve the situation. It's very complicated in many countries. Johan. Yeah, absolutely. I would fully concur with this, and um, I, I very much uh, support that you mentioned the product safety regulation, um, because this is something that works fantastically in Europe, I believe, right? We have very safe products, maybe the safest in the world that go to the European market, and this is clearly a model where we should also work with governments, with regulators, to say, this is being applied in this and this way, how can cybersecurity, uh, how can, can IT security be a topic um, when it comes to regulation, when it comes to increasing uh, uh, security across the market? Uh, is this a model to work with? And maybe the Cybersecurity Act, which we, th which we see, um, where a lot of discussion is being done about IoT devices, it may be one of the, one of the instances of the first ones they, they come up with. Maybe this can be something also to, to test and go into this direction. Um, product safety also works with standards. I'm coming back to standards, right? In Europe, if you have a standard, you, Im you implement the standard and then you uh, reach the conformity and you uh, operate under the presumption of conformity. And if this can get adopted um, as well for cybersecurity, I think we would be on a, on a very good way um, in, in different uh, areas or different sectors, like IoT devices. And of course we have different challenges now coming uh, additionally on top, um, because safety assessments have been done for decades 
for other for many reasons, right? And we see, um, we, we saw in, in in the automotive world, for example, it started with the safety belt, and then there were many many other safety features in the cars. Um, and unfortunately, these those have all or needed to be mandated at that time. And um, well, now we have the cybersecurity, and and of course the the safety feature or CE mark uh, is very much well known to most. Um, is on the day to market. So what means what does this mean to cybersecurity? Um, cybersecurity is a, is an ongoing demand of of, of management, uh, cybersecurity management or security management of of the devices which are used um, during their complete life cycle. So we need to think different. We, we need to think out of the box. How do we, how do we need to, to cooperate? And that's why also here, again, the, the chart of trust, um, the members are coming from different areas. Everybody's expert in his domain, like NXP semiconductors, for example, uh, looking into the security of their chips, uh, chipsets. Um, then we have the device manufacturers like Siemens, like Cisco, and they're looking into the devices. And then we have the uh, companies like Telecom, um, uh, looking into the communication channels, and everybody is expert in his domain and, and takes the accountability, the ownership. We have it in principle one um, to secure his part of the of the of this uh, supply chain. And also, IBM does it in the backend systems um, because you know how to secure the backend systems, while uh, the others know their domain, right? And and I think this is one of the most uh, important topic which we are, um, um, let's say, supporting here when it comes to those challenges. Thank you, Jack. Maybe this is a good moment to turn to the audience for the first time and see whether there are any questions out there that you would like to pose to the panel. We have one gentleman here. Maybe you can. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Bertrand Petit, in our search, we are a think tank on uh, cybersecurity. And uh, the question seems to be, we never regulate uh, the software industry. Uh, software you know, in the IP in terms of regulation are very difficult. So you, you are entering this new field. And my question to the panel is that, do you believe that the only way is open source software? Or can you regulate the software which is not open source? Hi, I'm Mitaro from NEC uh, Corporation Japan. And uh, my question is, uh, uh, I know the, uh, the agreement or the like, norm of the uh, cybersecurity, uh, like a uh, uh, cybersecurity take accord or the part score or other uh, cyber norm. So what is the obviously different of the uh, chart of trust uh, to the other cyber norms. <laughs> um, hi, Nicole Arabian from Ofcom in the UK. Um, I guess this question is more specific to Stefan from Siemens, but uh, I think earlier in your presentation you mentioned that you work with around 90,000 suppliers. And I was just wondering then, when you apply this charter of trust, if you um, essentially did a check or a view against all these requirements, and if you found that you know some suppliers may not comply, and if there's any lessons learned, you can tell us from that. Thank you. Yeah, maybe we take one more, and then we get to the answers. OK. Uh, I'm coming from Swiss Holdings, the association of the the uh, non-financial companies in Switzerland, large ones, including SGS. And uh, I, just, I just want to remark that uh, we are worried that uh, governments are just knowing what, to, what they do when they regulate. And so we are trying to do it actively from a bottom-up aspect that we are instructing in, uh, in, in conferences and so on uh, what exactly businesses expect, not tech companies, but just businesses as uh, SGS, what they have as problem. But my question then is, on the regulatory side, in the GDPR, we also have requirements for, um, for uh, cybersecurity, which are heavily fined if uh, not respected. And how do you see GDPR in your framework? Oh, 
Okay, thank you. Um, Stefan, would you like to start with a question directly directed at you? Yes, thank you very much. So coming back to the question from, from you from Ofcom, uh, yes, of course we checked uh, internally our supply chain and uh, our supply chain management. And uh, Siemens has a diverse uh, business portfolio with digital industry, smart infrastructure and mobility. And also in the uh, Stratcos, as we call them, uh, there's health and uh, wind industry, uh, Siemens Gamesa uh, and the like. So um, these uh, different uh, verticals uh, have different supply chain situations and what we have been doing is that we followed our approach. So we first take a risk analysis, finding our, um, let's say, suppliers which are critical for us. Uh, and then we, um, of course, um, uh, made a check and uh, yeah, there have been some cases which uh, suppliers have been non-compliant. So we sit together with them, we, we talk with them, um, and we are now in the um, phase of a, let's say, rollout of these baseline requirements. So of course we, we, we offer some time uh, for them to, to qualify on that, uh, and then do uh, a reassessment in that, uh, let's say, given time frame. So um, it's not something you can roll out uh, and, and, and just uh, copy, copy the baseline requirements on your website and that's it. You of course have to engage with the supply chain and uh, this is the approach we, we, we take at that time. Thank you, Stefan. Jack, did you want to, uh, to answer to that? No. Um, maybe to the other question, um, starting with the GDPR, um, privacy is, is one of our, of our um, uh, let's say achievements we, we want to have as part of the requirements in the supply chain. Um, so it is part of that. Simple. Um, of course, we have a, a European law on this. It's the GDPR, the global, da global, <laughs> the general data protection regulation, um, and we need, of course, to fulfill these requirements. And and um, the GDPR is quite a good example um, because it's already an achievement in terms of harmonization in Europe. Um, and of course, we would love to see this in many more countries in the world because we are looking as I mentioned before, on a global level, and we want to have a harmonized, those harmonized norms uh, on a global level because our customers are selling their products on a global level in, in different regions, in different countries, into different countries, into different legal systems. So we are facing, or our customers are facing um, the challenge that they need to comply to different rules based on different, uh, different uh, regulations. And this is something, um, coming to the second question on, on chart of trust and norms, um, as we are missing those harmonized norms in the world, we started to sit together and generated those baseline requirements. And then we mapped it to whether we have existing uh, norms in place, like 27001, just to mention one, and there are many more, and some are still um, in development, like 62443, right? Nobody knows exactly what does it mean to IoT devices, for example. So we need to, to find it out together and, and to, to implement it in the market. Um, and this is not only important here uh, related to the European Cybersecurity Certification Framework, but of course also to the requirements in Japan, to the requirements in, in, in the US. And in the US, for example, we see now the California IoT law, but this is only California. So what is about the, the other states in, in the US? How do we deal with that? How do companies deal with that? We are just the ones who, who uh, support those companies in in, uh, in certifying, for example, or verifying, testing, um, that the, those requirements have been, has, have been um, implemented properly. But um, what exactly need to implement and need to be implemented, this is usually the question companies are asking, and they are still um, yeah, have a vacuum here. Thank you, Jack. Laurent, would you like to take the question on software regulation? Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm, so I'm, I'm not exactly sure what you mean with the regulate world. So, so it, it may have different meanings in different contexts and diff for different stakeholders. If you mean government regulation, actually government stepping in and putting some mandatory requirements, 
I, I, don't see, uh, I don't see any appetite for saying open source is better than uh, this is an old debate and I don't think anyone wants to open that box. We'll be on that now. But um, what, um, what we can see is that uh, what we want to avoid is to have, um, I would say, a reaction from governments uh, facing the, the stress of cybersecurity becoming always more urgent and important, uh, saying, well, let's regulate and do it in a way that will make it, for example, secure by design. Because we have to, we have to be very cautious with the terms and the concepts used in, used in, the, in, the, in the business world, because they tend to be interpreted in a, in a very smart way in some cases, but in a very simple way and basic way in, in some other cases. So you will have some policymakers saying, well, okay, make it secure by design and that's going to solve the problem, right? So, uh, and so I make a regulation that software should be secure by design and it's your problem business to do that. Of course, they did not understand the concept of security by design, which is not an end, it's a process. And it's not because you you've, have implemented uh, security by design processes that your product ends up being secure, fully secure by design. You never have a 100% secure pro uh, uh, products. You always need to come back to it, which is why you have also to take into account the life cycle of the product. When the product is already in the hands of the customer, you, all, you need to continue to pay attention to the security, which is very complex for business. Right? This is a level of complexity that some policymakers understand, but not all of them. So, so the, the terms and the concepts are we have to be cautious with them. Um, I, I'm not sure um, there is an appetite uh, in, in the most advanced countries, those which are leading the, the, the debate here. I think they probably understand that jumping at regulation and you know, going fast and, and it's not the way forward because they have an industry and they don't want to undermine their, in, their, their software industry. So, so they have that level of understanding. The devil is in the detail and the complexity. They, they really ask the question, how do we do it then? We have to do something. It cannot be just regulation that's going to freeze this, the market or, or, or just uh, uh, undermine our own, own industry and, 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 and stifle innovation. So how do we do it? Um, and that's where it becomes more complex and we have to do work to understand how to do it. Thank you, Laurent. Um, Alex, I think you wanted to react to that. Yeah. And uh, well, uh, I take the freedom to, to put this on a bit more abstract level. I took three points from this. One is the government involvement. The second thing I would say is the complexity uh, in implementing things, these things and being forced to implement some stuff. And the last one is fines, uh, which can be put out by the government or in other ways. Let's start with the involvement of government. I mean, our past experience is that negotiated agreements, so the voluntary um, approach to things, often work, which also means in some cases, and uh, especially if there's a lot of money behind and opportunity, uh, they don't work. So I think it makes sense to have, um, like mentioned on product safety, yeah, we have a couple of things which would never have happened without product safety yeah, uh, requirements, or like the pressure equipment directive and so on. Yeah. Um, so we recently had a session with the Advisory Council uh, in, in Bavaria for the Econom Economic Advisory Council, and I was honestly surprised that um, from the audience came a lot of questions asking for certification and asking for rules how to certify. And what came up in this discussion was also, um, which doesn't come naturally for me because I have to admit I'm only since eight months in this tick industry. Yeah? Um, and I've been over 20 years in the industry, and usually you, you would try to avoid spending money um, if you are forced to doing it. Um, but what they were looking for is a level playing field. They, were, they wanted to have some standards, and they wanted to have a clear guidance on uh, what can I measure against. So that's the, the topic of government involvement. So I think sooner or later, and when you speak about software, you can also go further. You can speak about algorithms, yeah, um, autonomous driving, etc. Complex field, but I'm really happy that Charter of Trust has started this because, I mean, how do you start a journey with the first step? Yeah, and I think this is not only a first step, but already a giant leap which has been done by Charter of Trust. Which takes me to the second topic, 
the industry and, and, and our customers is the pain point, what's the complexity? I mean, you have, like I mentioned, PED, machinery directive, low voltage directive, you have uh, T3G conflict minerals, uh, tons and tons and tons of standards also, ISO 9000, IATF, whatever you need. And uh, that's why I also appreciate very much that COT has taken the effort to map all the existing challenges and requirements properly into what the Charter of Trust is asking for. And this is nothing inhumane, I would say, the Charter of Trust is asking for, but it's really, and that's why it's also called a baseline requirement. Which takes me to the last point, fines. As we said, or as I said in the beginning, um, voluntary commitments sometimes work, but uh, sometimes you need to fine. And fines can come from government, but from my own experience, I can tell you the worst fine is if you don't get sourced from your customer. And that's, I think, the leverage. And this is what, what Stefan has indicated. Um, it's pretty common that uh, uh, fulfilling some standards or certain standards and, and adhering to them, and sometimes also proving that you adhere to them, is your ticket to dance. If you don't have that, you're out. And I think that's the, probably that's the um, toughest uh, thing which can happen to you. Even, of course, government regulations help sometimes, uh, but it's not necessarily needed. Thank you. I'd now like to turn to our online moderator to see uh, what we hear from the community um, out there. Yes, thank you. We have one question from our online forum. S. Ju Kang is asking, are there any plans to involve other companies from other sectors? Any, um, Jochen, would you like to take that? Um, Charter of Trust, open for new members? Yes, for, um, yes, yeah, absolutely. And we already have uh, quite a diversity of sectors anyway. Um, yeah, and, and for sure, it's not a, not a, closed, closed, not a closed club. Yeah. So we, all, we also publish everything what we decide is, is for us important. And we, are, we encourage uh, other companies and SMEs to follow those requirements, right? Um, and it's not only about, and it should not start with the purchasing department asking whether you have, uh, can, can you show me the certificate X, Y, Z? It should start with taking the ownership. It should start taking the initiative putting cybersecurity on top of the agenda of the management of all these companies, SMEs, and not only corporates, and uh, down to startups. So even a startup can take initiative and secure his, his solutions and devices and whatever they are developing. Um, and it could be part of, of an innovation process um, and should be part of an innovation process today. And um, I very often hear that uh, startups, um, they do not have the... The, the money for that, or they do, do not, sh should not take care on cyber security, they should take care on their application. Um, but on the other hand, their, their financial report, or yearly financial report, they're also not doing by themselves, they're asking a third party. So um, ask for help, ask for help, and they, they are really outside, they're, they're, they are, yeah, to mention it, there are hackers in the field who can, who can help you. And um, if you do it right, um, I think every investor would appreciate that. And I even heard, learned yesterday from a discussion with an investor that uh, the, the um, how do you call it, the, the, the definition of the money of the, of the, of the, of the uh, uh, how much is the company, uh, on the value of the company um, was uh, um, also based on the on whether they should uh, or would be able to cope with cybersecurity topics. So this was an important Stefan, issue. Please. Yes, maybe maybe to also frame what what you said. I think uh, we have associated partners in the chart of trust, and we have also launched the um, uh, no we have. Uh, uh, members of the Chart of Trust, first, first layer, second layer is the associated partners, which is academia, which are think tanks, uh, which are uh, regulators, and we also uh, start to think about the Chart of Trust community, which then uh, is uh, what, uh, what uh, um, uh, Jack just said, with, with, with uh, SMEs, with startups, so, so all of the environment. So I think, um, yes, it, it will stay exciting, so stay tuned, uh, I would like to say it in answer to the question. 
Thank you very much. Before we turn to the uh, second focal point of uh, this panel, which is education, um, I just wanted to open the floor once more for questions, if there's anything else you would like to ask on supply chain security at this stage. Yeah, one follow-up question we have here. Follow-up, uh, I agree with what you say, except you miss a point, which is uh, urgency, okay? And therefore, what happened today is that you blacklist, okay? Yes, I want a 5G network, but uh, don't use Huawei, okay? So therefore, it, I mean, it's absurd, but since I see nothing, okay, I ban the product. So you're right to say that the education is tough. Uh, if you refer to, for instance, Mr. Macron interview to The Economist uh, two weeks ago, he said in terms of sovereignty, I will ask the tough question is that uh, when I build my 5G network, on which ground it is built, and do I keep my sovereignty or not? Okay, so the question is just starting to tilt in the head. And I will make a parallel with open source is that in the driverless community, uh, it's the most sophisticated IoT if you want, uh, the industry after having made uh, many mistakes, recognize that oh, we have been stupid because we have done ADAS 1, 2, 3, 5 in the same bucket. And now we split, we say, no, no, we have Adam F ADAS 5 autonomous vehicle, and the rest is assisted driving. And they say clearly, under the leadership of uh, Mobileye, they say, we will have a rule engine which will be open source. So, uh, and they are pushing into this open source standard in order to solve the issue. So, my point is that I don't see if you do that on the most sophisticated IoT, which is a driverless car, why don't you do it on a very unsophisticated home device and things like that? So for me, open source is a solution. If you have another one, please spell it out, but the urgency is there. Thank you. Do we have any other question in the room? That is not the case. Do we have an immediate reaction from the panel to the last contribution? Johan. Yeah. I'll, I'll try. Um, I agree with you and I don't agree with you. So uh, uh, regarding urgency, it's not, I would say, uh, it's not that we are currently at a decision uh, or at a point where you say do nothing or, or, or do things. It's a, it's a continuous process. Um, if you look at cybersecurity or uh, IT security standardization, this has been going on for many, many years and has been steadily improved. The standards have been refined, improved. New standards have been developed. New technologies are there. So it's a, it's a continuous process. It's not that we uh, say, okay, now we need to start or we don't start. Um, and this is also where the Charter of Trust takes a starting point and says all of these requirements we identify, some of them have already been there for a long time. Others are maybe new requirements where we say we need to uh, put more focus on, on this aspect, this aspect, this aspect. Also, the, the risk management approach, the different levels we take, is something that uh, is moving on and is moving on with higher speed. Industry does, give, does invest a lot in this and does give high attention on it. So I don't think it, it's now the decision, uh, do, we do, do we not do it or do we not focus on it? It is not urgent. It is urgent. The urgency has arrived. Um, we mentioned here it's up to the highest levels in, 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 in companies, to the sea level, to take this up to take the responsibility, and this is, is happening. On this topic of open source, again, I, I, as much as I'm enthusiastic about open source as IBM, we do a lot in open source, and we do see that open source developments help to provide trust in some areas, but I would say you can, it needs to be done well as well. If you do open source wrong, and if you do not consider the basic requirements you have uh, to achieve security, then it doesn't help whether you have open source or not. Um, so I would, I would not make this, uh, this distinction to say open source is per, per definition safer, more secure um, than, than uh, non-open source software, right? It's, it's transparent, but uh, if you implement, if you implement the, the, the software in a running system, you need to implement it just as other software as well. So it's, it's important to do it right and to have security as a, as a key topic when you develop the uh, software when you manage it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think it would, since we only have 15 minutes left, maybe we should 
briefly touch also on but, education still. But maybe on, on the it's urgency. Close to your heart. Please I, go I for think it. on the urgency, this is really important. Um, while the processes are covered in many companies, but not in all, <laughs> at all, um, we see now 7, million, 7 billion connected devices, but we know about numbers of expect, expected uh, numbers of 30, 50, or up to 200 billion connected devices. And we do, if we do not act now, how many vulnerable devices do we expect in the market if we do not act now? So yes, we, do, we need to act now, the urgency is there, and, uh, but we need to do this on a, on a, on a, on a harmonized uh, and, and joint approach. I think that's important, and that's why we are discussing with all the with all the governments in this world to have this level playing field. On one hand, we call it the baseline requirements, and then, uh, of course, up going up based on a risk uh, approach, and then uh, also there have harmonized standards. And by the way, to the to these um, 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 open source topic, I think there is no software at all which does not contain open source today. Yeah, yeah. so um, we need to deal with that. Anyway, and we need to and, and how to how to to check whether implement uh, things are implemented properly. So, um, if you look to devices, uh, many vulnerabilities are because security features are not implemented correctly. So, the, even the chips offer a good functional set of features, um, but if you do not use them properly, uh, the, the end device is not, it will be vulnerable. So, and, and that's why we, you need to ask third parties to have a look at it, to evaluate it, and then give you feedback, and you can um, um, correct it in the, in the right way. Thank you, Jacques. Alex, one century ago, our society started to grapple with the questions of communicable diseases. We talked about that a little bit earlier, given that we had a couple of people who could not attend our panel. Um, an important building block in that was um, uh, teaching the public of uh, the basics of hygiene. And this went even down to the fact of showing people how to wash their hands. So there's a museum on hygiene in Dresden, which you can visit, where you can see how this was done a century ago. Now, my question to you is, um, for cybersecurity, for digital security, um, what is the role of basic cyber hygiene of employees and of the people? Where, how important is that in, in, in winning this fight? I mean, you, um, this is a leading question, right? Because this is definitely the most important thing, and it has to start, um, basically, it has to trickle down from the top. Yeah? And uh, uh, this also reminds me a bit, sorry for making the analogy again, quality management, yeah, when this was introduced. Yeah? Uh, in 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you could go to a company and say, yeah, do you have a quality manager? Yes, we have an, a, a department for this. Um, yeah, today it's instilled into the processes, going back to what Jacques said, yeah, it has to be, it's part of your DNA. And this is exactly the same thing which has to happen, and it can start actually on a very low level. I mean, very simple things, like don't click this button if the mail looks fishy. Yeah? And um, of course, then moving up and down in the hierarchy to make sure that, that you behave correctly. And um, the other thing is enable the people to have their own judgment on to be able to assess what is my exposure in my very own context. And this can go from using software to just applying something. Yeah. Laurent, your view, um, basic cyber hygiene education, is that uh, a task for industry? Is that a task for the states? Where does that sit? Well, well this one is not, yeah, okay. Um, I think it's both, it's a task for everyone. And it's a, it's, a, it's a task for, for industry, it's a task for uh, government. Uh, we see, well, historically, this has been the first thing governments have tried, tried to do. They, they started with awareness raising, actually. Uh, there is a problem. Be getting the message across that there is a problem and that people should do something. And, and they targeted this at everybody, users, uh, end users, families, uh, vulnerable populations, uh, businesses, etc., SMEs. Uh, businesses have always played a role in, in that space. Uh, the ICT sector has been quite active in, uh, in promoting uh, good practice. Uh, so um, I think it's a shared responsibility. And, uh, and, and, and yeah, that would be my response, yeah. Yeah, well, thank you. Jochen, uh, how much cyber awareness do we see in boardrooms today, actually? In, in where? In, in boardrooms of board companies. Rooms. Uh, I, would see, I would say a lot. 
I think we see a lot of awareness, and um, it's 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 discuss It's one of the key topics that's discussed everywhere. I would say, yeah. There is, but still, um, there is the uh, the sense of, of of urgency about cybersecurity. But there is a need to educate what you can do and how you can how you can drive things forward. And and this is, I believe, what the Charter of Trust has has put up as as their key topic, yeah, to to take up this, if you like, momentum, yeah. And, and uh, bring it further with uh, education, with guidance, um, the community building that was mentioned. Um, all of this is, Im is important. There, there maybe too many people are still a bit sort of, uh, don't have a clear idea, how can, I, how can I move forward? What do I need to do? And this is where we need to start. And um, yeah, help people also to take the responsibility. Yeah, I think there is a lot of readiness to take the responsibility, but there is guidance required on what everybody in companies uh, can, needs to do and can do, how to move forward, how to take this responsibility, how to implement the proper steps um, to, to uh, get to better security. Yeah, thank you. Um, Stefan, um, one question to you also. You mentioned in your opening presentation uh, the, the emerging gap of uh, cybersecurity experts. What are the uh, objectives that the Charter of Trust is uh, setting itself there in this regard? And, uh, yeah, I think companies take the approach, okay, uh, what is a um, necessary and desirable level of education in what process? So first of all, uh, of course, cybersecurity uh, concerns everybody. So all employees should be trained on a certain level. However, due to products and processes, we need to specify the training level as well. So that's why we um, uh, kind of uh, come to the discussion point of a role and responsibility concept uh, structured approach. Uh, which is um, currently under discussion within the Chart of Trust, um, and uh, it, it builds upon the um, uh, IT uh, management um, that, that we have. Uh, what uh, we in Siemens also do, and what we also see, of course, is the community and network effect. So we have uh, an annual conference, uh, internal Siemens uh, cybersecurity conference for three days, which uh, brought the effect that this community uh, is growing constantly, that the exchange between uh, experts is growing constantly. So this is also an, an uh, effect in, in education, spillover effect, that we also really need. Thank you. Um, Jacques, maybe a question to you. Um, in industry, is there a consensus what a cybersecurity expert looks like? And in turn, uh, are we making it easy for the education system to churn out the experts that we need? Oh, this is interesting, yeah. Um, I think different roles, and this is what Stefan said, um, it's about the role and the responsibility. And, and of course, um, the, re the requirements um, related to cybersecurity training is, should fit to this role. Um, we see a lot of uh, uh, certificates for different purposes in the market. There are plenty of opportunities to, to train. Um, what we are missing is that the companies send their employees to train, to those trainings. So this is something we need to promote. And, um, and on the other hand, um, we all look for experts. And what is really missing is that universities are, are releasing more experts. Uh, recently I had a discussion with a German Fachhochschule. Um, they release, or they, they train um, Forensic experts. How many forensic experts do they release per year? What do you think? 80. <laughs> Those experts are completely uh, <laughs> taken by the German BKA and LKA, which is the police and, and the police forces and um, the businesses do not have any chance to, to benefit from those experts, right? So we need more experts um, coming from, from different domains, not only from the, from the, from the uh, IT department, but also um, from, from management, from economics. Lawyers need to understand cybersecurity. What are the requirements in terms of contracts? Um, purchasing departments need to understand what is the requirements. They, they receive a catalog, but don't understand the catalog. So um, we need... Again, norms or rules um, that that they that it makes them e more easy in the daily life to understand what what is re what is requested from the IT department, from the device manufacturing or, or development department. So I think that's that's the point. If I may add to this, also it's this is a marathon. Clearly, just to give you an idea, uh, 
industry service. Yeah? When, you, when you check a, let's say, chemical plant or something like this, you have a graduated engineer, uh, which has gone through a pretty exhaustive education. And then afterwards, it still takes this person five to 10 years to be allowed to sign off um, the, te the, the tests and checks and certify it, basically. And now suddenly, this person on top gets the challenge of cybersecurity. Yeah? So you suddenly have wireless transmitting sensors. How do you judge now? What is the risk? And, and this is even the, the, the next step. And coming back to the question, what is a cybersecurity expert? You can have domain experts in the IT, but in the future, midterm, you will have to have domain experts with IT knowledge. Thank you. We are almost running out of time for this session. I nonetheless wanted to turn one last time to the audience to see whether we have any questions with relation to education. If there's anything? Yeah, one here in the front. Do you already see the use of real-time auditing, real-time monitoring software? For instance, you, like American company BitSide Technologies, they, they look at your internet-facing assets, give you a, a, secure, a security rating, so you can really focus on, well, the red dots with your scarce resources. If you lack uh, CISOs, you can focus them on exactly the stuff that they need to do. And so and it's, it's real-time and it's data-based, and, and not only awareness, because it's a, yeah, you, we'll never manage that. Jack, Maybe to answer that from a, from a um, supply chain perspective, we receive more and more requests from customers to not only look into the device, whether the, device or whether the features have been implemented properly, but also to look into the, into the um, complete life cycle of the supply chain. So looking into the production facility, which is probably somewhere in Asia, looking into the development department, which is uh, in the US, uh, whether there is uh, implemented access control, uh, who gets access to the keys, to the, uh, who does the key management, is the key management properly documented. Um, all this is, is important here. And uh, until the end of life of a device, if you throw it into the basket, um, where, what is about the keys, right? Or if you sell it on eBay, uh, who, who will receive it? Uh, and what does it, what will he do with the device? And, and this is thing, these things are, are uh, very important and need to, take in, need to be taken into account. Yeah, there are a lot of uh, maritime AIS systems running in the middle of the Sahara, so it's, uh, yeah. yeah but, but in the end, this also goes back to education because from my own experience, I can tell you that um, a couple of CEOs I've been able to talk to, they did not understand from the first point how a vulnerable web server can impact the robot in the manufacturing. They're because it's disconnected. Yeah, I have OT, I have IT. No, it's not that way anymore. And I think for many people here in the room, we are preaching to the choir, but we have to, we have to go to the people and, and, and uh, approach them on, on the level of knowledge they have today. Against our best efforts, we didn't meet, uh, make um, had much su success this morning in uh, bringing diversity onto our panel. But uh, there's a question uh, related to that that I want to ask uh, um, Stefan: um, How is the diversity challenge in cyber? Um, or if you turn it around, how large is the untapped potential that you have? Well, I think um, diversity you can really uh, bring to to two different levels. Yeah. So um, when you when you look to to to, to people who work in cybersecurity and you bring diversity to that, I think we should engage all of all of the people to uh, really choose a cybersecurity career path. I think it's interesting. We have to promote that, to have, make it more attractive. Uh, when you when you also look at um, uh, the diversity aspect in uh, uh, process technology and people all together, I think this is something we really should focus on and um, uh, yeah offer structures, offer ideas, offer methodologies also from industry perspective to really meet that bottom up uh, regulation idea. I, I I kind of like that, and um, uh, diversity um, cybersecurity also uh, on the board level is for me connected to awareness. So this is also what chart of trust. Uh, is really working on to keep the awareness level high in the boardroom and not saying, okay, now it's done and now we know it all and that's it. Um, it's constantly moving. And I think um, the last aspect I would, I would put to that is also that we should really heavily engage uh, to be a thought leader in that field and to really also try to uh, offer ideas and results and approaches to the wider public. Thank you.
Unfortunately, we're running out of time. I think I'd like to close uh, with uh, one round here. If I could ask all of you to make a short statement of what you would like the audience to take away from today's session, that would be much appreciated. Jochen. And you want me to start? Okay. Yes. Okay, I would say um, there is a high sense of urgency about uh, the need for uh, improved security. The Charter of Trust provides a uh, uh, fantastic basis with identifying key requirements, supporting uh, and spreading the, uh, uh, the necessary knowledge of what you need to know about cybersecurity. Um, we are strongly committed to drive this further and we are looking forward to others uh, joining community, taking up, um, looking at the website, everything is, is available. Um, and it's a, it's an, a, a task that we're, we members of uh, the, the Charter of Trust take a lot of responsibility and want to make this successful because it's important for the industry to grow, to take up new technologies and to uh, have the necessary trust and, and reliability in new technologies. And that's important for the future of, of, of Europe and global trade. Thank you. Jacques. Well, um Perfectly, uh, I can only uh, add something. Um, I think it's really about encouraging you as companies, as SMEs, as startups to make use of what we developed here in this group. Um, it's available, it's, uh, it's mapped to certain standards which you can fulfill, which you can show as a, uh, as a supplier to all your customers. And um, as the tech industry, I think we are um, we are there. We are a partner to you as uh, as uh, um, yeah to, to fulfill what what you what you implemented properly and uh, to support you to sh to generate trust between you and your customers. What I really like about the Charter of Trust approach is it's really, really pragmatic. Yeah? And it's, it's uh, taking, going back to um, existing standards, it's not reinventing the wheel, it's not super complicated. And uh, I think it's an excellent foundation and, and guideline uh, which should be applied to enable the people to make their own judgment in their very own context. What is the risk they are exposed to and how can they mitigate it? And that's a classical thing which then the tick industry can help and, and also certify where required. Yeah? So um, I think this needs to be really carried out into the world. Yes, I think I see two takeaways, one abstract, one concrete. So the abstract one is, and I uh, connected to President Macron who said, uh, we will not get defeated by complexity. Uh, I think uh, that's, that's your takeaway. We have made a start uh, with the chart of trust. We offer really results. And the second thing is that this was the start of an ongoing journey. So um, stay tuned and keep, keep the chart of trust watching. Okay, so um, self-regulation works sometimes. So it's good to see. Sometimes regulation is needed, sometimes. It should be well informed and it should be well thought through. Um, there are very constructive initiatives out there and the Charter of Trust is clearly one. It's very encouraging. Uh, it's a private-private initiative. This is a sign of maturity. Um, perhaps ending with a, a positive message. We, cyber when we talk about cybersecurity you know, in the media in particular, you know, it's always a bit frightening and scary and rightly so. Uh, some level of that is needed. But there is also, so we have a sense that, you know, oh, we're lost. But, well, there are also some positive messages. And, and this, uh, the Charter of Trust and other initiatives that bring together stakeholders to, to progress and to build trust are really a sign in going in the right direction. So there is still a lot of work to do, as we've seen on the skills and others, other areas. But really, we should, um, we should contribute and, and, and leverage uh, these type of initiatives and, 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 and feed the dialogue with the policy level. That's, that's my angle. So, so I think the input from the Charter of Trust to the policy level uh, is particularly important. And, and, I'm, and I'm sure we're going in that direction. So it's a very positive takeaway. Thank you, Laurent. This brings this uh, panel to its end. I'd like, like to thank all of you for your contributions. And my special thanks also go to the IGF technical team for hosting us here today. And of course, to all of you, to the audience, for your interest. I hope you enjoyed the discussion. And please join me in a round of applause for our speakers. Thank you. Thank you.